the seven churches we're looking at really through three lenses. Isn't that right? There's the historical lens. These were actual churches. They physically existed. There's the church age, which represents the phases the church would go through leading up to that last phase just before Christ comes again. And then the third application, the most important, I would say, is the personal application. The conditions that Jesus points out, the changes that need to be made may apply to you and I as we sit here this morning. Isn't that right? And so we need to be, we need to have ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying to the seven churches. Now, we've also seen, quite interestingly enough, that the seven churches are laid out in a chiastic structure, like a chiasm. In other words, just like the, the seven-branch candlestick there in the sanctuary, there, there are connections that are made. Ephesus is intimately connected to which church there? Laodicea. What is the connection between Ephesus and Laodicea? Does anybody remember? Yeah, closest to the first coming. Ephesus, closest to the last coming. They both, by the way, have a condition they know nothing about. Lost their first love, they're unaware of it. Laodicea is rich, increased with goods, and has need of how much? Nothing. Completely unaware of their condition. They need the true witness, amen, to tell them their condition. What about Smyrna? Closely connected to Philadelphia. Does anybody remember the connection between Smyrna and Philadelphia? First love was Ephesus. Smyrna and Philadelphia, Jesus had nothing to say negative about either one of those churches. Yeah, all positive. What about Pergamum? We studied Pergamum the last time. Pergamum and Sardis. Pergamum was falling into compromise. Sardis was coming out of compromise, right? And so intimately connected. Now we find ourselves at Thyatira. Thyatira, right there in the middle, the pinnacle point. Now, when you look at a chiasm, a chiastic structure, it's important to recognize that even though they're parallels, you know, the book of Revelation itself is written in this chiastic way. You've got the prologue matched up with the epilogue. You've got the seven epistles matched up with the seven angels, seven seals to the seven bowls, et cetera. But you get to a point where there is no parallel. There's like this pinnacle point, this, this key moment, a deciding factor in the chiastic structure. What is it in the book of Revelation? I got that arrow right there. Satan cast out. This is the deciding factor of the, of the entire book of Revelation. That casting out, by the way, if you study it in Revelation 12, is not just the casting out prior to the Garden of Eden. It's the casting out that took place after the cross where the angels had to make their decision. And they said, we don't want you here anymore. And then there's a casting out personally for all of God's people where they say, we will have nothing to do with you. That's the, that's the pinnacle of the chiastic structure of Revelation. Well, the church of Thyatira here is no different. It, this is the deciding point in the seven churches that will lay out the history of the church till the coming of Christ. There will be a battle raging right here that starts, that goes till Jesus comes again. We begin here in Revelation 2 and verse 18, and to the, church, or to the angel, the messenger of the church in Thyatira, write. Now, this was, again, a physical place, 40 miles southwest of Pergamum. You see how we're making a circle here? Started in Ephesus. We're going north to Smyrna, north to Pergamum. Now we're heading southeast of Pergamum, 40 miles. It was known for its manufacturing of purple dye. That will become so relevant as we study this church the color purple. And if you're thinking of a church age, we apply this to the church age of 538 to 1798. Is that a relevant date range, do you think? 538 to 1798, critical. Seven times in scripture, no less than seven times, this date range literally is mentioned in Bible prophecy. Now, the purple dye, by the way, you may remember Lydia in the book of Acts. She was from Thyatira and she was a seller of purple. Now, the Bible goes on to say in Revelation 2 and verse 18, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like what? Like fine brass. Now, you remember, to each one of the seven churches, there are attributes of Christ that are brought in. These attributes are so critical 
because these attributes apply. They're kind of like the eye salve in Laodicea. They're, they're like the gold triad in the fire. The, the attributes of Christ are what we can look to to have victory over whatever negative problems are happening in that church. Well, in this instance, John is instructed here to write these attributes about Christ, that he has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. What can we garner from that? Well, first of all, his eyes being like flames of fire. It continues down in verse 23. It says, I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. These eyes, all searching, go right to the core, don't they? In other words, not only does Jesus say, I know your works, but he can say confidently he knows the motives behind the works. Amen? Amen. Eyes like flame of fire. Remember in Luke 8 and verse 17, when Jesus said, for nothing is secret that will not be what? Revealed. Nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Jesus can look into the innermost being of who and what we are. He knows not only the works, he knows the motives behind them. And this eyes like flames of fire is not just in a negative sense. And when I say negative, I mean in the judgmental. You know, we, we hear the word judgment. Where do we go? We go to a dark place in our minds like, ooh, judgment, bad, negative. Not necessarily. Eyes like flame of fire are also for our benefit. Amen. We read this in Last Day Events, page 277. The eyes of the Savior are above us, around us, noting every what? Difficulty discerning every danger, and there is no place where his eyes cannot penetrate, no sorrows and sufferings of his people, where the sympathy of Christ does not reach. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. Aren't you thankful this morning that we serve a living Savior who has eyes like flames of fire, who is looking out for you and I's best interests? Doesn't end there. The other attribute is that his feet, taken from Revelation 1 and verse 15, were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace. Why do you think Jesus' feet are described as being refined in a furnace? Well, we read in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he what? That he suffered. Those feet walked on this earth in your nature, a nature just like yours, knowing the trials and tribulations of life. Tried to a higher degree, I would say, than any other human being. Amen? Amen. Tried in the furnace of trial and tribulation for you and I. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Those precious feet walked for you and I, and we're told in the book of First John that we ought to walk even as he walked, setting us as an example of the, of the path that he tread. Revelation 2.19 comes to this point. It says, I know your works, Jesus says to the, to the members there at Thyatira. I know your works. By the way, a phrase that is said to every church. Love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Well, brothers and sisters, I don't know how you feel reading that list of attributes, but I would like those to be said of me, wouldn't you? This is a high list of attributes. This is a high list of character traits that should be desirable to every Christian. Isn't that true? Think about it. Love. We talked about it in Sabbath school. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide in faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is what? The greatest is love. Not only did they have love, it says that they had service, which is the same Greek word for ministry. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of what? Ministry, service for the edifying of the body of Christ. He knew their love. He knew their ministry. If they had ministry, they had gifts, and they were using them to God's glory. What about patience? They also had patience. Romans 5, by the way, the same Greek word for patience is where we get perseverance. Same word. Romans 5 says, and not only that, but we also glory in what? You glory in tribulations, right? 
Everybody here? Yes. Yes, Sam, we do. <laughs> Knowing, why do we glory in tribulations? Knowing that tribulation produces what? Perseverance. Is there a reason that God would bring you through a trial, through a tribulation, through a test? It's producing, it's chiseling, it's making things come out of your character that normally you would not see. And perseverance or patience, character and character, hope. They had patience, they had perseverance. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, here it is again, the testing of your faith produces what? By the way, is patience important in the book of Revelation? Here is the patience of the saints, right? So critical. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking how much? Nothing. Brothers and sisters, this is a awesome list of attributes or character that these people had in Thyatira. I know your works, Jesus says, love, service, faith, and your patience. And then this interesting phrase, and as for your works, the last are what? More than the first. To understand this, we're going to have to unpack this a little bit further. One thing we need to understand, remember, I said we apply this age to 538 to 1798, also known as the Dark Ages. This is the Great Divide in Christendom. This is the longest period of persecution, by the way, that God's people have ever had to endure. Do you know that? Thyatira is the longest book or the longest church out of the seven. The most verses are dedicated to this church. It's the longest period of time. Jesus referenced it in Matthew 24. He said, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, Jesus says, nor ever what? Shall be. Jesus says, I'll never put my people through that kind of length of time ever again. So bad was it, so hideous, that he continues in verse 22, and unless those days were what? Shortened. No flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days were will be shortened. The persecution was cut short during this time that God would preserve his people. Thyatira represents this time period. It's the, it's the tale of two women in one visible place. It's a separation of the true and the false. One visible, the other would have to be hidden because of persecution. Now, you know, I ask this all the time, and you guys know the answer. In Bible prophecy, a woman represents Church. A church. Why do we say that? Jeremiah 6, verse 2, among many other scriptures. God says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. God's people often brought into the symbol, symbolism of a woman. Not just any kind of woman, a pure woman, amen? One without spot and blemish. And we see in Revelation 12 sort of this concept of the true woman come out. Later in Revelation, there is another woman. Isn't that right? Now, we want to hit hard the point this morning that those are not the same woman. Amen? There is a huge difference between those. You know, some people are teaching that the pure goes into the wilderness and becomes the harlot and then comes out as the harlot. That's not true, brothers and sisters. God has always preserved, even if it's just a small number, he's always preserved his faith, his people, his church. Amen? This pure woman standing on the moon representing the, the word of the prophets. They are not the light, just like the moon is not the light. It is a reflection of what? The sun, which is the true light. She stands upon the word of the prophets. She's clothed with the sun, Christ righteousness. And above her head are how many stars? Twelve. Twelve stars representing in the Old Testament. The Old Testament church was the twelve tribes. In the New Testament, it was the twelve disciples, right? And there is a attacker at her feet. As soon as she's pregnant, as soon as she gives birth, the attacker tries to strike. We read here in Revelation 12, verses 5 and 6, she bore a male child. Who's this child, by the way? It's Christ, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled. Where did she flee? 
into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days, 1,260 days. That's the dark ages, 538 to 1798, 1,260 days. By the way, what is she fleeing from? What is the woman fleeing from? Yeah, we read on in Revelation 12, 13 and 14. Now, when the dragon, who's the dragon? Satan saw that he had been cast to the earth. He persecuted the woman and gave birth, birth to the male, who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Same description as verse six. It just describes the time, times, and half a time differently. But we know prophetically that's 1,000. 260 days. That's the time period, by the way, that's mentioned no less than seven times in Scripture. The Dark Ages, 538 to 1798. God's people would be driven into the wilderness. You see, for the longest time in pagan Rome, the devil fought against God's church from the outside. Isn't that true? Great persecution from the Roman emperors, from the state, if you will. But then there came a time where Satan began to realize that he would have greater success, not from the outside, but that rather he would come and fight against God's people from the inside. And so Satan no longer fights the church from the outside. He fights from the inside. And God, in order to preserve his church, the purity of his message would raise up torchbearers. Men and women who were faithful to God's word in the greatest time of persecution this earth has ever seen. God preserved his truth through messengers in the wilderness. Did you hear that? He preserved his truth through messengers in the wilderness. Can you think of another time where there was a message that came out of the wilderness? John the Baptist. Was the church so corrupt during the time of John that God had to come up with another way to preserve the truth? Yeah. Almost like a foreshadowing of what was to come. I want to, for the next couple minutes, if you don't mind, I want to look at some unsung heroes. Are you open to that? Some of these names you might know. Some you may have never heard before. I have trouble pronouncing half of them. But the reality is that these are men, these are followers of Christ that blaze this torch under the most trying times of this earth's history. And I think they deserve a look, don't you? Let's look at the first one, St. Patrick. How many have heard of St. Patrick? Most everybody. A fifth century Romano British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. He was known as the Apostle of Ireland. The Roman Catholics, by the way, have proudly and exclusively claimed St. Patrick, and most Protestants have ignorantly or indifferently allowed their claim, but he was no Romanist. His life and evangelical church of the fifth century ought to be better known. I agree with that statement. A little digging into history, you'll find that he separated himself from the Roman edicts of the day. He fought against the teachings of the church of his day. There is strong evidence that Patrick had no Roman commission in Ireland, as Patrick's churches in Ireland, like their brethren in Britain, repudiated the supremacy of the popes. All knowledge of the conversion of Ireland through his ministry must be suppressed by Rome. There is not a written word from one of them, being the Roman sources, rejoicing over Patrick's additions to their church, showing clearly that he was not a Roman missionary. Let's take that a step further. St. Patrick was a Sabbath keeper. Did you know that? Many scholars have dug this truth up. This is taken from James Moffat in his book, The Church in Scotland. It says, it seems to have been customary in the Celtic churches, the very ones that St. Patrick started, of early times in Ireland as well as Scotland, to keep Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as the day of rest from labor. They obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. And he says that as if like, you know, literally, we rejoice, amen? Amen. Evidence that God was preserving the true line of faith, amen? Let's move on through history. 543 to 615 AD, Columbanus 
or Columban, was of the Irish church, which had been established and nurtured by St. Patrick. Do you see the thread that's starting here? And which became a great missionary movement of the day. Columbanus was educated and trained for the work at the Celtic College of Bangor. The Celtic church kept alive the truth and flourished in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales for centuries. In 573, with 13 companions, he was inspired to commence missionary work in Gaul. He set up schools first in Gaul, then in Belgium, Germany, Australia, Switzerland, and northern Italy. I wish we were that busy. Not only did he impart and plant the true faith amid the people, but he also brought education to benighted Europe. 864 AD, the Bulgarians were won to Christ by Greek and Paulican believers who were opposed to Rome. The Paulicians, I guess is the word there, Paulicians, were a large group of true believers who in this period began to migrate from Armenia and Asia Minor into various areas of Europe. The Paulicians have been grossly mis misrepresented by historians, but now they have been recognized as true Christians who withstood the apostasy of the day. They brought revival to the scattered remnants throughout Europe. Various incidents in Europe reveal the existence and witness of true believers. Let's move on. 1050 AD. Berengarius of Tours, an ex-Roman Catholic prelate who united with the Waldenses. Anybody hear of the Waldenses? Made a powerful impact upon France, England, and Italy. He had thousands of followers. He called the Church of Rome the congregation of the wicked and the seat of Satan as did also the Waldenses, he publicly opposed the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, which is the belief that the priest turns the bread and wine into the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. 1104 AD, Peter de Bruges from the French Waldensian Valley stirred Southern France by his biblical apostolic preaching. Misrepresented as usual by Rome, finally he was martyred at the stake in 1124 AD. 1128, Henry of Lazouan, a gifted disciple of Peter de Broglie, powerfully proclaimed the gospel to the masses of people, especially in southern France. His influence was so great that he was assailed by the leading Roman figure, Bernard of Clairvoy, who relentlessly attacked him. He was finally imprisoned and disappeared. 1150 AD, Arnold of Brescia. A powerful and eloquent preacher exposed the errors of the papacy. He was far ahead of his age. He denounced the union of church and state. Can you imagine? He preached in Switzerland, France, Germany, and Italy. Even a church synod met to answer Arnold. He was finally burned to death, but he left behind numerous followers. 1175, Peter Waldo of Lyons, France, a wealthy merchant who forsook his riches and proclaimed the gospel and the doctrines of the New Testament. He exposed the church of Rome as the man of sin. Amen? And the beast of Revelation, he greatly revived and increased the number of Waldensians throughout Europe upon persecution. He withdrew to Bohemia and his followers to the Waldensian valleys. He stimulated the circulation of the scriptures. Rome was fraudulently branded has fraudulently branded Waldo as the founder of the Waldenses in order to hide the truth that there were numerous Christian dissenters against Rome centuries before Waldo's time. Let's talk about the Waldenses. The Waldenses first separated from the established church in the time of Sylvester, Bishop of Rome and Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. They rapidly spread their faith throughout all Europe, but they were particularly numerous in the provinces of South France. They possessed the New Testament in their own provincial, 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 thank you, language. From the Latin Itala Bible, which had been translated from the incorporated Greek manuscripts of Latian. This led to the development of a pure form of Christianity. The Albigensian civilization was in striking contrast to the rest of the benighted peoples of Europe. Six Roman Catholic councils were conducted to counter the Albigenses. Finally, ending in the appalling crusade of the extermination under Pope Innocent III, altogether over one million were put to death. One million. And you know the story of the Waldensians, how they had to hide in the wilderness 
hand copying scriptures, bringing them into the townspeople as, as secret as they could in their garments, in their clothing. They would find a, a precious soul that was open to truth and they would pass on portions of scripture. Memorizing entire books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just so that they could pass on the written manuscripts. Wow. Great Controversy, page 41. Under the fiercest persecution, these witnesses for Jesus kept their faith unsullied. Though deprived of every comfort, shut away from the light of the sun, making their home in the dark but friendly bosom of the earth, they uttered no complaint. With words of faith, patience, and hope, they encouraged one another to endure privation and distress. The loss of every earthly blessing could not force them to renounce their belief in Christ. Trials and persecution were but steps bringing them nearer their rest and their reward. Brothers and sisters, we're told in our day, time just in front of us, that every earthly support will be cut off, gone. We may have to live a life very similar to those torches in the wilderness. May we be found faithful. Amen? Amen. Let's move forward. Names you may recognize now. John Wycliffe. This outstanding Englishman rose like a brilliant star amid darkness of the papal night. A scholar of Oxford University, he began lectures on the Bible in 1360 AD. He exploded with scripture, the corrupt practice of indulgences, and concluded that the popes were the antichrist of prophecy. He strongly attacked the Catholic Eucharist or, sub, or transubstantiation and brought to light many fundamentals of the gospel. Probably the greatest work was the translation of the Bible into English. John Huss of Bohemia preached the scriptures, attacked the errors of Rome. As Huss's biblical knowledge increased, he soon learned of further falsehoods of Rome and finally concluded that the Pope and his court were members of Antichrist. At the council of Constance, Huss and Jerome were tried and damned to the stake. And that's one sentence that brings a lot to, to, together. If you have time, study in the Great Controversy, the chapter on Huss and Jerome. Absolutely phenomenal. After Huss was burned at the stake, Jerome was then in prison for another year, where he was hung in the dungeon in the most painful <laughs> positions by his arms and legs, fed only bread and water and scantily at that. Sick and probably to the point of death, he was drugged before his Roman persecutors, where he was told to recant what he believed. And under those dire circumstances, in a moment of weakness, he actually did. When they put him back in the cell and he began to ponder what had happened, his heart broke as he realized that he had basically turned his back on Christ, the very one who had sustained him all that time. And in weeping and repentance, he was brought before the trial again, and he recanted that he had recanted, right? He found that it was greater persecution to turn from Christ than it was to face any human being. Amen? Amen. Fear not them that can kill the body, right? But rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Great Controversy, page 114. These are the words of Jerome. As he's drugged before the rulers one more time, what he says, do you suppose that I fear to die? You have held me for a whole year in a frightful dungeon, more horrible than death itself. You have treated me more cruelly than a Turk, Jew, or pagan, and my flesh has literally rotted off my bones alive. And yet I make no complaint. For lamentation ill becomes a man of heart and spirit, but I cannot but express my astonishment at such great barbarity toward a Christian. They drug him before the fire because they're going to burn him alive. It says here on page 114, air long sentence of condemnation was passed upon him. He was led out to the same spot upon which Huss had yielded up his life. He went singing on his way. His countenance lighted up with joy and peace. His gaze was fixed upon Christ and to him death had lost its terrors. When the executioner about to kindle the pile stepped behind him, the martyr exclaimed, come forward boldly, apply the fire before my face. Had I been afraid, I should not be here. Amen. Amen. 
You know, I'm rarely moved by scenes of war or tales of, of you know, war between countries, but something that moves me to the, to the bone is stories like this. Doesn't it move you? Let's move on. 1452 to 1498. I'm going to need help with this. Savonolera of Florence, aroused by the corruptions of the church, he preached with great power and conviction. He taught justification by faith and passionately uplifted the crucified Christ before the people. He concluded that the papacy was Babylon and urged the people to fly far from Babylon. Rome, in her usual manner, arrested, tortured, and publicly burnt this superbly gifted scholarly and saintly man of 46 years, casting his ashes into the river Arno. 1482, John of Westphalia, doctor of divinity of Erfurt, attacked Rome's heirs and proclaimed the Bible as the sole source of faith. It is by the grace of God alone that the elect are saved, he boldly preached. I despise the Pope, the church, and the councils, and I give Christ the glory. He communicated with the Hussites with whom he found himself in agreement. In his old age, he was condemned by the Inquisition and perished in their dungeons in 1482. Can you see why Jesus said, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience? And then he ends with this phrase, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. See, we've covered three quarters of the Dark Ages, but then there was a new reformation, if you will, that took off with blazing power. And Jesus recognizes that there would be even more enlightenment that would come. We read in Anderson's book, Understanding Revelation, the believers are commended for their works, especially the last works. A change came at the end of the Thyatiran period when the Great Reformation arose. Such men as Luther, Knox, Calvin, Zwingli, and others, scores of others, came to lead the people back to God. Amen? Do you realize, how many brought your Bibles today? Your physical Bibles. Do you realize what you hold in your hand? Do you know that for every single letter, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, that's in this entire Bible. There are scores of martyrs who spilled their blood to preserve this word. Do you think it's ironic that at one time you would have lost your life for having this thing? And now we live in a world where these Bibles are in every home, every nightstand, everywhere, and yet rarely ever read. Matter of fact, they're little threat to the devil at all. Crazy, isn't it? Ironic. I want to play some footage for you. You may have seen it. The footage is of some Chinese that are receiving their Bibles for the first time. Now, mind you, they could be jailed for having these Bibles. They were smuggled in. You'll catch in the beginning of the video, there's a suitcase that they were smuggled in that they're opening up. I just want you to capture the emotion, the excitement of these believers as they get to hold this sword in their hand for the first time. And I wonder if it wouldn't rekindle in us a new love for the word of God. Amen. Amen. Maybe Facebook needs to go away and the book needs to come out. Amen. All right. Let's watch now. <laughs> a blood-bought book. Greatest gift that we have right here in our possession physically right here now is the Word of God. Amen?
Great Controversy, page 593. Those who endeavor to obey all the commandments of God will be opposed and derided. They can stand only in God. In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed where? In his word. They can honor him only as they have the right conception of his character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test. Shall I obey God rather than men? The decisive hour is even now at hand. Are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? I hope that you're asking that question personally this morning to each one of you. You know, we are to be the people of the book, amen? We should be able to sit down with a Bible and give anybody we come in contact with a thorough Bible study on salvation, on the law, right? On the state of the dead, on hellfire, any one of those subjects and many, many more, we should be a people of the book. We should have this book so well known that people would recognize us once again as the people of the book. I'm, I'm afraid for us, brothers and sisters, as I consider how little time we spend in God's precious word. Another quote that Again, I only read it to jar us by the Holy Spirit's power. It says, as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, by the way, would that be Sabbath keepers, Seventh-day Adventists? A large class of those, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Let me stop right there for just a second. You know, it's come to my attention that there are actually those in the church, and I'm not speaking here at Maranatha, I just mean at large, who are teaching and preaching that the imposed mandates are a good thing. That scares me. Because when you see the state mandating things that are about your personal freedoms, we should all be alarmed. Amen? Yes. Now, let me read the next sentence. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Let me ask you this morning, which would be the easier side? Accept the mandate or stand your ground? And this mandate, I'm not saying in any way is the mark of the beast. You know what I'm saying? It is, is the building blocks for what is coming. It is the building blocks to train a society to obey them rather than the word of God. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. We, some of us here, may have to stand before courts and give your case. Do you know your Bible well enough to do that? The time is now brothers and sisters, to get back into the Word. Amen? Amen? Whatever is currently taking your affections from Christ will soon be of no value. You know, I'm reminded, you know, because sometimes we get drug away from the truth by other people. Have you noticed that? Disguised as love. I love this person or I love that person so much. I want to spend more time with them. And we actually make that person an idol and they drag us away from, from God from our right relationship with him. I'm reminded of Adam and Eve, right? Adam loved Eve so much that he could not live without her and he chose to eat that fruit. Then when God comes to the scene, Adam throws her under the bus. That love, that twisted love can never take the place of our love for God, right? Jesus said we must love him supremely. 
paraphrasing, but he who loves brother, mother, father more than me, right, is not worthy of me. Whatever is taking your affections from Christ will soon not matter. I don't care if it's entertainment. I don't care if it's the, you know, the dress of the day, job aspirations. It just doesn't matter, brothers and sisters, because soon it will be of no value. The only value will be what's written from this page to this page and whether or not it's in your heart and being lived out in your life. You see, there's coming a time, Amos 8 and verse 12 says, they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Take that time now, brothers and sisters, please. Learn it, memorize it. Thy word I've hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. We might be cellmates someday. Right, Rudy? And we're going to have to write on the walls. What's Ephesians 2, Rudy? Do you remember that one? And we'll write and we'll compare notes and we will bring out the scriptures that we know. And, and uh, you know, you, Dave, you might be down the hall from us. We'll say, Dave, what was John 4, verse 12? Right? Hide it in our hearts. When we're brought before rulers and trials, we're told that the Holy Spirit will bring it to our remembrance. Not some magical, hey, now all of a sudden you know scripture, but you must first have put it in your heart. Amen? Then he brings it out. You see, you and I have been called to be torchbearers in this day, in this age. Just like those faithful in Thyatira. Signs of the times, we're told this. We should remember that the church, enfeebled and defective though it is, is the object of Christ's supreme regard. Constantly he watches over it with tender solicitude and strengthens it by his Holy Spirit. Will we, the question comes to us, will we, as members of his church, allow him to impress our minds and to work through us to his glory? What do you say this morning? Amen. Amen. We have a torch to share with the world. We have three of them the three angels' messages, and they must go to all the world. And I want to be a part of that finishing work, don't you? Breaks my heart, brothers and sisters, when we gather as a church, official church functions, and a majority are not here. Prayer meeting, take advantage of it now. There's going to come a day when you're going to say, I wish I would have went to prayer meeting. I wish I was there. Because every time we are opening the word, we're opening inspired writings and we're reaffirming, we're building up each other in the faith. Why do we do that? Because we need that to change us by beholding, we become change. And when we come together, there's a power in the gathering of the saints that's just not there all the time when you're one-on-one. -on -one. That's why Jesus gave us the church, right? Do not forsake the assembling together as some do, right? Even the more as you see the day approaching. Do you see the day approaching? Amen. All right. I've stepped on toes long enough. Next week, I'm going to preach again. It's my turn once again, and we're going to finish Thyatira. We're going to look at the other side. We've looked at the faithful, which Jesus is not done with. He has some more to say to them. But we're going to look at the other side of the 1,260-day prophecy there in Thyatira. Let's stand together for our closing song. It is, give me the Bible. See why I chose that? Amen.